Molo Sambonani, hello, how's it? Good evening, Renant and Shalom. Welcome to another episode of The Big Daddy Liberty Show. Remember, every Wednesday at 7 p.m., your favorite fat boy joins you on your little screen, whether you're watching on your phone or your PC, and some of you even uh, broadcast us onto your mega screens. I've seen some photos of you guys sending them through. Uh, super appreciated. Welcome. This is the Big Daddy Liberty Show. Ho -ho. Do I not have a interesting, interesting guest uh, for you guys tonight? But before I get to my guest, a quick reminder, please. Just some housekeeping rules, if anything else. Your only price of admission here at the Big Daddy Liberty Show is for you to hit that like button. Do it right now. Whether you're watching, of course, on the simulcast on Twitter, YouTube, or Facebook, hit that like button, people. Because tonight we're going to have a conversation which I think is transformational. It's, it's definitely one which is personal for me right now, given where I'm at in terms of my life, my quality of life, and of course, my health. And um, you guys would have seen uh, the the journey I began three weeks ago now. Uh, some of you called it really extreme, but uh, I have a an actual expert tonight who can talk to us about not only my own personal journey, but maybe yours, right? Maybe you're someone who is suffering from a lot of health ailments right now linked to maybe being overweight, obese, or even morbidly obese. Um, and of course, with that, the sort of health complications that we're beginning to see as South Africans and really as families. So we're going to have that conversation tonight. Um, and of course, as always on the show, we're very interactive. I'm going to keep an eye on the comments. I see you guys rolling in. Moonchild, Nora Duvenacher, Dawn Pickett, RJJ. I see you all coming in thick and fast. Remember, all you need to do throughout the show as we tick along is to hit that like button. Keep my engagement over that 50% mark. And um, with that being said, let me not waffle away except to say... Uh, as I quickly just type my notes out here for a moment. Give me a second, people. Maybe as I'm typing my notes out, guys, hit that like button. Hit that like button. Um, you know, what we're going to do tonight is really traverse a few issues. And this isn't going to be a boring old, boring old interview. Um, you know, there are some tough questions that I'm going to ask of the prof, you know, in, in relation to our health. And, you know, maybe even answering the question at the end of this, are we being lied to? Especially those of us who are paying the cost of bad nutritional advice. And you know, you don't have to look far, just look at your screen right now. I'm a severely, in fact, I believe morbidly obese individual and I'm not the only one. The stats that I read here, and I'll quickly share those with you just to set the scene of just how how prevalent of a problem obesity is. And I sort of facetiously called it a pandemic in the description of this video, but it sort of really is because listen to this. Um, this is, of course, from the Western Cape Department of Education's, pardon me, Dep Department of Health website. And um, it sort of posited as, as a did you know type factoid. And says, did you know that 31% 31, 31 of men and 68% of women in South Africa are obese? You know, being overweight or obese not only affects your self-esteem, trust me, I know that, it also leads to heart disease and potentially an early death. And I would maybe even venture to say an almost sure um, early death if you remain at dangerous weight levels. Um, it then goes on to say this is a big problem, not only in adults, but also in children. This is the concerning number. Now, if you're a parent, pay attention here. In so far as 13%, that's one, three percent of children are obese. This is a massive, massive problem. And it's one that I think we need to have an open and frank conversation about, because I can tell you now, on a personal front, you know, I, I my wake up call was when my doctor, shout out to Dr. Ramji, literally said, hey man, you are now in that dangerous territory of being a pre-diabetic. Um, <clears throat> and of course, on top of that, I was already a hypertensive, you know, I had high blood pressure, you know, what, what we were raised to call high, high 
<laughs> but um, you know, to, to have these sort of conditions as someone who's only 35 is a sharp wake up call. When you find yourself unable to walk down or even up the street that you live on, um, you know, up the stairs, because you're just so out of breath, because you're carrying, in my case, an extra what? A uh, hundred and, let's call it, uh, let's a hundred kgs or so. That kind of begins to tell you the story of how bad things are. So with that being said, let me not waffle on. Let me bring on a voice who really is, um, goodness me, the, the, the I, I, you know, at the forefront of that, if I may steal from the book's title, the, the, one of the seminal works he has, A Real Meal Revolution. I am talking, of course, about um, Professor Tim Notes. Let me bring him on screen. There he is. Prof, good evening and welcome to the BDL show. Hi, Big Daddy. Lovely to be with you. Just really looking forward to a fantastic evening ahead. Absolutely. And really, I, I'm, I'm exceptionally honored to have you on the show because, you know, as I said, when we were chatting off air in preparation for this interview, I've been digging into a lot of the literature, you know, not only from you, but international thinkers on this topic, because as I mentioned, it's such a personal issue. You know, there are far too many of us as South Africans who are dealing with being overweight, obese, or even more, to, you know, to being morbidly obese. Talk to me about just the the explosion, if I can call it that, of that sort of overweight to obese metric that we're beginning to see in South Africa. Well, I think they've been there for some time. It really begins in 1977 when the dietary guidelines are changed. Under pressure from the Department of Agriculture in the United States, they decide they were going to make cereals and grains the basis for the diet. And they're going to remove mm. saturated fat and animal fat. So we removed animal produce. And the problem is then we started the processed food industry. So if I can just begin, go back 4 million years. 4 million years ago, we had the first dietary revolution. That's when humans mm. started catching animals and we started eating meat and fat particularly. That gave us this big brain and this tallness mm -hmm. That's and made us different from the apes. And what divided us was we were eating meat. And we did that for until 18,000 years ago. And that's when the agricultural revolution came along because oh, we'd run sorry. out of big fat animals to kill. That was the reality. Now we had to find something else. So we found cereals and grains starting in the, the Middle East and spreading around the world. So that was the second revolution. That was the agricultural revolution. But now in the last 30 years, we've gone through the ultra processed food revolution. And that's mm. the real driver. And why it's a driver was because when we took fat out the diet, we replaced it with sugar. And mm. sugar is highly addictive, and particularly the high, the other processed foods are absolutely addictive. And that's what's causing the obesity at the moment. Obesity mm. is a disease of hunger, and people mm. are never satiated because they're eating foods that do not satiate because they're nutrient poor and highly mm. addictive. And that's the key. Mm. So if one, as you will know, or you'll be learning, if you want mm. to get rid of your obesity, you have to find foods that satiate you. And those mm. are foods that are full of fat and full of protein. Those are the two mm. things that satiate you. But sugar and carbohydrates simply make you more hungry and you want to eat some more. You know, I interviewed a guy who weighed 600 pounds some time ago. 600 pounds and he lost something like 200 pounds i mean it was unbelievable what mm. he had lost and and i asked him mm. i tell tell me about your weight he said you know when i was heavy i was always hungry i could eat a full meal and in half an hour i'd be absolutely famished again and that's the mm -hmm. reality it's of hunger and and that never gets addressed and we know treating people with obesity and diabetes that to get them right you have to control the addictive eating behaviors or else you haven't mm -hmm. got a hope. And that, that's absolutely. That's, yeah. So what's happened? So sorry, you're asking, yeah. So you're asking what's sorry, happened. 1977, yeah. ultra processed food, highly addictive, obesity rates going through the roof. And the problem is my profession, what I, which I was in, but I was kicked out for telling the truth. And we'll come back to that mm -hmm. and kicked mm -hmm. out of my profession for telling the truth. The, the profession won't face up to it because the profession is too influenced by the food industry and, of course, the pharmaceutical industry. And mm. that, that's the issue. So you don't get the truth. You're not going to get the truth about mm. what's really making us fat. And so governments talk, and but they won't act. 
because they know mm. what they have to do. To act. They have to act against the food industry, and then they can't do that, or they're not prepared to do it. Mm. Prof, there are three major things that you've raised in your opening thoughts that I want to unpack before we move on, uh, because I think they're very important in terms of helping people understand that key shift in thinking around effectively what's on our plates. I think that's one of the mm. more easiest ways of describing it. And I'll bring myself into this conversation insofar as my own experience, because I, I do think it speaks to a lot of how other South Africans who are struggling with obesity, um, the sort of the quagmire we find ourselves in. Let me, let me be precise and specific. You know, being raised in a Zulu household, uh, and I think like most other South African households, you know, I, I look at the the plate, um, and if I if if I can make it a, a pie diagram for a moment, you know, the the let's call it eighty percent of it really is your your highly refined carbohydrate, complex carbohydrates. So you know, rice or ipapa or something like that of you know, the, which forms the bulk really. Of, of what's on your plate. Uh, perhaps 10% is some form of ishebo, uh, sorry, I was trying to think of ishebo in English, uh, <laughs> stew or gravy, <laughs> which would be where your meat is, if there is any meat, because that also has become quite prohibitively expensive for some folks. Um, but, or alternatively, some sort of derivative of meat. So, um, you know, we, we will often have, um, and this is often, often where we differ quite a bit culturally, but you know we, we'll have uh, 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 organ meats in particular uh, and the like, which are for me I always used to enjoy and I still do to this day, and I do believe there's nutritional value in them. Um, it's always been funny to me how they're just sort of cast aside in the nutritional paradigm, but we'll get to that. Um, and of course, if if at all some form of veg, usually a starchy one, if I'm to be brutally honest, like a potato or if we're lucky, some sort of green bean or, or the like. So I'm just trying to chart what we're then often accustomed and socialized in, if I may call it that, insofar as how we're raised. You know, a very starchy, starchy plate. Is, is that perhaps part of the problem we're dealing with here? Yeah, absolutely. Because if you look back to the Zulu nation, when the Nguni tribes came from the north, they, they were pastoralists and they brought their cattle with them. And yeah. what happened in the eight the 1890s was the rinderpest came through and wiped out all the cattle. Mm. And the immediate effect was that the Zulu population and the causes were forced to go to the cities. And what did they start eating? They started mm. eating the white man's food. And that was, mm. but they were not adapted to it. The, we had adapted over a period of time, not fully, because grains had come into the East or to, to West, Western Europe, had come into the about 1800. Uh, but I think that the reason is that if you look at Shaka, I'm sure that Shaka wasn't eating what you told us. I'm sure mm -hmm. he was eating a lot more meat. Then sugar comes along. And if you look at some of the Dlaminis, for example, they were known to be the diabetic prime uh, chiefs in the Zulu nation because they were the first mm -hmm. who could afford sugar. And that mm -hmm. was mid 1800s. And so the sugar comes mm -hmm. in, but it's still the processed food hasn't come in. But more recently, it's the it's the food that that's come in. And I think, you know, the that that we're, we're all so similar in our biology, but we we're yes. slightly different. You know, if you come from from uh, the Middle East, you are slightly better adapted to eating grains. But mm. if you come from the Arctic and you're just eating seal meat, and you, you're only adapted for eating carnivorous diet, you aren't adapted to eating cereals and grains and things. And the body mm. adapts subtly over hundreds of years or thousands of years. But but and th and that's the issue. But the the core is humans started out of off as carnivores, and we haven't really adapted in any other way. We are still basically carnivores. Some people mm. get away with a vegetarian or vegan diet, but the human body is not really designed for that. We're designed for eating animal produce, particularly meat and fish. Absolutely, produce. yeah, absolutely. And, and 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 maybe let me jump in here. And and the the, the, the second component that I wanted to bring out, you know, is um. You know, you spoke of the agricultural sort of epochs, if I can call it that, that really catalyzed how we began to eat, you know, made certain items cheaper, obviously pushed easier onto the, 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 the you know, the consumer's plate. But there's also government policy behind this. Um, and you spoke to this, you know, obviously the difficulty 
in what you have, for example, in convincing the bureaucrats, if I can call mm -hmm. it that, and, and the establishment of him broadly call them that, into saying, hey guys, if we know that the evidence is pointing to the plate at its most basic level, the nutrition, um, as being a, a real reason behind a lot of the metabolic disease that we're seeing rise, you know, the diabetes, the uh, hypertension, and really associated with it, the the um, the obesity. Um, why is it, Prof, that we still see, for instance, uh, you know, if I walk into my doctor's, uh, not, not, not Dr. Ramji, shout out to him, uh, but a doctor's mm -hmm. room, if I can hypothetically create one, you'll still see the, the pyramid where the grains are, we're told, are should form the, the basis of, of a meal. Like, why are we still pushing this dogma? And let me, let me add to this. For some of us, it's incredibly dangerous because we already, in my case, being warned of being pre-diabetic. And in some cases, actual diabetic patients are being told this is still the most effective way to eat. So let me tell you, when did maize become the main food in South Africa? You know, and people won't know. It was 1920, 1920. And how did that happen? When gold was discovered in the Witwatersrand, there was suddenly this accumulation of people from all over South Africa and elsewhere into Johannesburg, and there was no food. Mm -hmm. So what did they do? They started importing maize from Lesotho. And the Lesotho people got very wealthy selling maize to South Africans. But then the Lesotho people realized, actually, they'd get, make even more money if they... Sorry, so we cut out there. So the, mm -hmm. the Soto citizens realized they could actually make more money by going underground on the mines. And so they stopped producing mm -hmm. the maize. And then the South African government at that time had made so much money out of, out of the gold. But they said, well, let's start a new industry. And they promoted the maize industry. And that's why you have the maize triangle uh, in mm -hmm. Johannesburg and Pochestrum and around those areas. And that's when it starts. And maize then becomes the primary food. And that's where the problem starts because we're removing, we've had the rinderpest, we're removing fat and animal protein out of the diet, and then we make maize the main food. Mm. To talk, to address the issue of why do the doctors still teach the, the pyramid? Well, the answer is because that's what's taught, and that is driven mm. by industry. So, you know, I went to court for four years to say why that is all wrong. And this two weeks ago, I published a paper in the British Journal called The All Open Heart. And what I showed there was the most important study of dietary relates and long diets and long health, uh, future health, showed that the scientists who were doing a study worth $700 million, they hid the evidence. Mm. They hid the evidence that the diet was causing harm, substantial harm. Mm. And that's what's happened. So, so, you know, I've written a lot of books, but in my trial, after I finished my trial, we wrote this book with Marika Sporas, The Real Food on Trial. Mm -hmm. And that describes all the evidence we presented about why the diet is wrong. Mm -hmm. Did it make any difference? <laughs> it doesn't make any difference because the Dietitian Association in South Africa are controlled by an organization called the International Life Sciences Institute, which is a front mm -hmm. for the sugar industry. And that, mm -hmm. so that sugar is so powerful and the industry is so powerful that the dietary guidelines simply will not change. Mm. That frightens me. That truly frightens me, considering the, the health implications and really the millions of South Africans who are dependent, really. You know, we, we, we've heard a lot, Prof, in the, the last year, really, especially with the current pandemic of COVID-19, of trust the science, trust the science, we're being told. And science is an actual method of inquiry. And if the data suggest something that we need to be able to shift and to accept, or not even accept, that, that, that sort of makes it a religion, but effectively change course to match what evidence and data is showing us. So perhaps let me zoom in for a moment um, to the third element, and we will move on, don't get me wrong, and I will get to the, the trial that you went through, Prof, because I think it was quite a seminal moment in terms of shifting people's thoughts uh, on this. You know, I think there's a lot of attention paid to it. Um, and it got people like me, for example, very interested on these topics. But before I do that, let me just do a little bit of housekeeping. Welcome to it. You're watching the Big Daddy Liberty Show. My name is C. Claire Ngobese, Big Daddy Liberty. I'm in conversation with the good prof himself, Professor Tim Noakes. And um, we're beginning to cook with grease, excuse the pun, um, on the show as we really get into the meaty bits 
of the the interview. Uh, but uh, remember, please, 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 if you're watching, hit that like button. If you're loving this conversation, hit that love uh, like button, pardon me, um, and share the link. I do see your questions, guys, in the comment section. I will start posting them sort of in the, the second half of the show. You're with us for the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Welcome to it. This is the BDL Show. Um, Prof, perhaps let, let me move us on then to where I really wanted to get. And I think you've quite aptly set out how, you know, we have we saw a shift in effectively nutritional policy um, where, and I think it's, it's Food Inc. There's a movie, I, a documentary I watched a few years ago, which was very important in my research in beginning to point out how supposedly uh, cheap food has hidden costs in it. And maize is definitely one of those crops which, because of its mass production for multiple reasons, um, often government policy being behind it, behind it um, you know, we're seeing, for example, it perverts the food pyramid, pyramid, pardon me, insofar as what we should be eating. For Americans, for, for example, they saw an explosion with the subsidized corn of uh, high corn... Um, Syrup. Okay, oh, high fructose. On, Thank sir. you very much. I always forget the ordering of, the, of that particular <laughs> expression. And it's had devastating effects on the the food that they eat. So it's in the movie he refers it to it as the illusion of choice. Where if you walk into a supermarket, for example, now this is where I want us to go for a moment. You know, when we walk into a supermarket for a moment, we don't realize just how much and how many of the items we pick up in what we think is a diversity of products actually has the same stuff in copious amounts, either sugar or that corn uh, syrup. Yeah, 80% of processed foods, ultra processed foods contain sugar. And that's the addiction, that's the addictive component that keeps you wanting to go back because these foods are designed to, to make you absolutely addicted to them and to want more. And that, mm -hmm. so we talk about Moorish food, I want more of it, but that's not what food is about. Food is about nutrient, providing you with the decent nutrients to make your body healthy. And that's mm -hmm. all you need. And what's happened is we're getting this overload of energy with too little nutrients and particularly too little protein we're beginning to realize. So, so that's the problem. We've got to go and eat the foods that we were designed to eat, which as I've indicated, were the animal produce that, that we, we evolved to eat over millions of years. Mm, absolutely. And perhaps let, let me get to that particular point then, uh, because, and again, I want to bring myself into this so that, you know, my viewers who've been charting my progress can understand why this has worked for me. Um, and there's two components, uh, Prof, and you sort of alluded to them at the beginning. When you are an obese individual, part of the journey of deciding to beat obesity is understanding the psychology behind, for instance, why you overeat and beyond overeating, why you'll binge eat certain types of foods. What do I mean by this? Well, I was definitely not binge eating spinach uh, or, you know, uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, hey. sorry, I can't think, for the life of me, a, a fatty steak, you know, I wasn't binge yeah. eating those items, you know, what was I binge eating? You know, I was that chap who was sitting in front of Netflix and, you know, with the Doritos chips and the, uh, 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 no, I wasn't much of a soda person, but just to be hypothetical, mm -hmm. you know, people will sit and consume two liter bottles of, you know, of, uh, very sugary drinks and sweets and the like. But, and, and, and of course, at the same time, have a very sedentary lifestyle. Not many of us really do exercise at the requisite level. And of course, the bigger you become, the less likely then you even become, you know, inclined to, or uh, less inclined rather, to exercise because of the joint pain and the like, you know? So you can't exercise your way out of this problem as most people will tell you to do. Oh, just walk around the block, fatty, they'll say. And I'm like, well, you know, it's easier said than done when you're 212 kilograms as I was. Um, I've gone down now a little bit, thank, uh, thank Hashem. Um, but the point I'm getting at is there's that psychological component uh, linked to the diet, which of course is a vicious circle. And then the other component of it is, you know, you always have that that advice prof, and it might grind your teeth as I even say this. You know, someone's saying, oh, just, just have multiple meals in the day. You know, have six to five meals, just make sure they're small. Um, you know, those are the two areas which we, we, it's drummed into us. And both areas have 
an impact in preventing that weight loss and getting us healthy. Can can we unpack those two areas, Prof, as we move the conversation towards banting, low-carb, high-fat, and, of course, intermittent fasting? So that'll be the prize of where we get to. But using Good. this hypothetical fat guy, let's let's chat about him. Sedentary and okay, snacking the whole day. The first rule is you can't outrun a bad diet. You absolutely yes. can't. It's got nothing to do with calories in and calories out. It's all about hunger, and you've got to sort that hunger out. So people who are counting their calories but still eating the same diet, it's not going to work. You can't reduce the calories and think it's going to work in the long term because you'll ultimately get hungry and you'll start eating the same amount that you used to. You have to get rid of the hunger, and that means you have to change the nature of the food that you're eating. And what the Banting diet shows is as soon as you put animal produce in and cut out the sugar and cut out the refined carbohydrates and limit the, 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 the less processed carbohydrates, but we limit them and we limit fruit and absolutely no uh, soft drinks, no sugary drinks, absolutely none, mm -hmm. and no sugar added anywhere, the weight starts to fall off. And I'm really interested to see in the comments, people saying, I've lost 100 kilograms or my family lost 100 kilograms on this diet. That's right. And that's the reality. It's, that's, this, this diet is unbelievably successful. And, and let me just remind you that, that I had type 2 diabetes and I've reversed it on this diet. So mm. people need to understand that. I was in a worse shape than you are. I, was, I lost 22 kilograms uh, by changing mm. my diet because I was promoting this old idea, lots of carbs and lots of sugary drinks and so on and running marathons didn't help me. I still got type 2 diabetes and I could only address it by changing my diet completely to this mm. diet that I follow now. And I should be dead. You see, I've, I've had diabetes now for at least 12 years, but it's in rever I've reversed it. Now, not too many people... Wow. Not, not too many people. I'm twice your age, incidentally, a little bit more than twice your age. And so not too many people have survived at my age with diabetes for 12 years without losing limbs and losing eyesight and so on. And the, the sure. only reason I'm talking to you tonight is because I changed my diet and was able to reverse my diabetes. Diabetes is the worst disease. It is the worst mm. because you die of slow, progressive death. And what motivated me was I watched my father die from this disease and I couldn't help him. And that killed me. And so sure. part of the reason for why I'm so, such an activist on this front is because I saw my father die in the most horrendous circumstances. And it's happening every day. We have 2,500 new cases of diabetes every week in South Africa. Now, sure. every single person is going to die of diabetes. This is not a disease you escape. You die from diabetes, and we don't address it. You know, we address other diseases, but we don't address diabetes. Sure. Prof, it, it, it's a scary, scary, scary situation to find oneself sitting across your doctor, trusted doctor, and they give you those news that, hey, man, you are in dangerous territory right now. Your sugar levels are effectively uh, out of whack. Um, or not to use that expression, but I'm just using it. It's my expression. Um, just to try and understand, you know, what, what I was being told here. Of course, I'm still pre-diabetic, but my doctor's pretty much saying, look, you, you're on the cusp of becoming a diabetic at this stage. Um, so the, the beauty, the beauty is that you can completely reverse that, absolutely reverse mm. it, by just mm. cutting your carbohydrates to 25 grams a day, and you will be cured. You may mm. not lose all that weight, but you won't progress mm. your diabetes you won't progress to diabetes. And it, you're not told that this is a reversible disease. You know, we have the, my foundation, the Noakes Foundation, has the Eat Better South Africa campaign. And one of the best moments of my life was speaking to a group in, in Mitchell's Plain and those areas where we, where we have our programs. And the mothers came in, coming up to me and hugging me and kissing me and saying, Dr. Noakes, you've given me hope because mm. all my family died of diabetes and I've seen it. And I didn't want to go to the doctor because the doctor would tell me that you're going to get diabetes. And I knew what that means. And now I can go to him and say, I don't, you can test me because I know how to control and reverse my diabetes. And that's the message mm. we really need to get out. And, and thank you for getting that message out. That's, you know, I see you as a, a, one of the people who can flip this thing in South Africa because you have such a big following.
that, that Prof, you can I really make hope so. difference. And, and, and I was just saying, Prof, I really hope so because it, it's such a personal journey for me too. In fact, let's get into it now as we gear ourselves towards discussing the, the what what now? What do we do? How do we change? And what, what, what exactly do we do? Prof, as I said, I got to my highest weight of uh, I can't think of, remember now, 220 something kilograms. Um, and the first thing I did, as I said, because of those two areas I spoke of earlier, was to get the psychology right in the first instance um, and to break the food addiction and really um, the carb addiction, the sugar addiction, if anything, um, and the bad habits. And then the second thing, of course, was before I even contemplate any exercise, because I, I you know, I, I want to be brutally frank to anybody who's watching. You know, I, I am I'm in, ex in excess of 200 kilo kilograms. I'm not going to be the guy who runs or walks. Uh, you know, it, just the amount of pain it, it literally physically brings on is a disincentive and it can knock you out of being in a good head headspace. Um, so the first thing I did, and this is where I want us to go. The first thing I did is, of course, diet change. Um, you know, cut all the carbs, cut the sugar, um, and begin to focus on being satiated with, you know, a, a, a hand, a good, a, a palm-sized uh, piece of meat, whatever it may be, lots of veg, and a little bit of oil, in my case, a, a touch of it. Um, and of course, more importantly, the fasting. In my case, I took a, a more, in, a, in inverted commas, extreme fasting route, because I use long-term fasting to break the cycle of my habits before. So the first thing I did before changing even the food was to fast for uh, four or five days. That sounds extreme, and people freak out when I said this, and but there was good science behind it. And so far as I fast every day, having electrolytes, uh, drinking electrolyte solution, so as to keep my energy levels up. And what it did is break that emotional bond uh, to food. Your thoughts on fasting, Prof, before we get into low-carb, high-fat? It's brilliant because and it's all fat. And what happens now, when you fast, you're just turning, you're using all that fat, and that's what you want to do. You want to burn that fat, and the quickest way to do that is to is to fast. And so, and that that's the key. You've done it brilliantly. Your the your you raise what we call blood ketone levels, and they then can mm -hmm. satiate you. They take away your hunger, and that helps. But you did absolutely correct. And you know, mm -hmm. a person with a hundred kilograms extra fat can can fast for for a very long time. And Absolutely. basically, you've shifted now to a high-fat diet. You're eating a high-fat diet. What I've yeah. learned in the last year is that we've over-promoted too much fat in the diet. For people mm. who are really heavy, I think you've got to put lots more protein. And Yolandi put the, a little note up there, and she said 70% protein. Now, that may be a little bit much, but I'm beginning to realize that we undervalue the importance of protein because it's difficult to get very high-protein diets. But you personally do not need to eat any fat because you, you're yeah. trying to burn the fat. You should be eating much more protein, and I absolutely agree with that. And, but, but you need to make sure you're satiated, and if the protein satiates you, that's fine. If it doesn't re re satiate you, then you're going to have to add some fat in. But mm -hmm. the reality is that the fat in your body has come from fat in the diet, and that, that's the right. point which we didn't realize before. We used to say it's the carbs are driving it. It's assisting, but actually the fat that's stored has come from fat in the diet. So it helps if you can reduce your fat intake as well. Absolutely. And maybe let, let's get into that insofar as, you know, because I want to chew on this, this the fasting thing for a moment here. Um, because the, and, uh, as part of the series, because as I said to my fans, full transparency um, and accountability, of course, to them, I would chart the journey. Um, and yes, if I, memory serves me right, my starting weight was uh, 220, 221. Uh, and in that first week, so as I said, in the first week, I was literally going to go into ketosis via fasting. Um, and of course, on a daily basis, I uh, mix a little solution of a bit of salt, uh, potassium chloride, and of course, a bit of baking soda, just for the electrolytes. It's basically, it's basically power aid without the sugar. Um, mm. It's the same. It's the same stuff, uh, effectively. So, uh, Prof, I, I kid you not. I, I'm I'm a very big person on when oh, excuse the pun, but I'm big on outcomes. 
And on a daily basis, I was, I was doing little vlogs showing people the weight loss. It began at around being a kilogram a day um, that, that I lost. And at its zenith, on the, on the fourth day, I even lost a massive 2.2 kilograms in a single day. Again, making that point you were saying, the body was literally fat adapted and was burning the, the stores of fat that I have. I did break the fast, of course. And the fast I broke exactly in the way in which you, you just alluded to. It was a, a moderate amount of protein and lots of veg. And when I say yeah. veg, I followed the real meal revolution yeah. insofar as, ve you know, green veggies, stuff that goes, grows above the ground. Talk to me about this book and its importance in teaching these sort of um, uh, uh, lessons, pardon me, in what is really great to eat and what isn't. Because you, you sort of color coded it, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. So the Real Meal Revolution started because David Greer was running across the China and they ran out of food. And the Mongols said, listen, you're not going to get to the other end of the wall of China if you don't eat fat. <laughs> and so mm. they, they ate pork fat particularly. So they ate pork fat for a couple of months and did very well. And when he came back, he said, Tim, I see you're promoting this high fat diet. Let's write a book about it. And so with Jono and, mm. and Sally Ann, we produced this book. And uh, we, Sally Ann Creed made the contribution. She said, these are the green list of foods you can eat. This is the orange list, which is kind of restricted. And the red list, you absolutely have to avoid. And that's the basis for that book. That is the brilliance of the book. And it, it caused a revolution in South Africa because people started reading it. And then they realized, my gosh, losing weight actually is not such a big problem. And if, as soon as you eat these foods, you lose your hunger and it's easy to lose weight. You know, when I went on the, the diet, I couldn't believe it because the reason I went on the diet was because I wanted to test what these people were saying. I said, they're lying to us. Mm. They're saying, they led, said, lose six kilograms in six weeks without hunger. I said, that's impossible. You have to have hunger. Well, in two days, I'd lost my hunger. And then I realized that they'd got it. Mm. They'd solved the problem. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> but absolutely, you know, if, if you don't do it, you won't believe mm. it. And that's the problem. The the doctors who are the real problem are the thin doctors who eat a lot of carbohydrate because then they can't understand. Absolutely. Um, I'm they, lost there for a moment. There you know, they, the thin doctor says, yeah, but I'm disciplined and I don't eat too much and that's why I'm thin. And that's not the facts. They're just that's lucky right. that they've got a metabolism and a brain that doesn't allow them, doesn't need to overeat. The doctor who you need is the one who's lost weight. That's the one you need. Then they can help you. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Prof, thank you. Let me just get uh, into a little bit of housekeeping just to remind the viewers where we are, who are we talking to. This is the Big Daddy Liberty Show. My name is Sikhne Ngobese, Big Daddy Liberty. I'm in conversation with uh, Prof Tim Noakes. Um, shout out to the good Prof. He's uh, laying down the knowledge here tonight. And uh, if you've just joined us, please hit that like button. Don't delay. Hit, it, hit that like button right now. Um, it is your only price of admission. Doc, as I as, as, as I sort of move our conversation into our last, uh, let's call it 15 minutes, if you don't, if you don't mind indulging me in a, few, a bit of extra time, because I do want to get into a lot of questions uh, and put some comments up on the screen. There's a lot of nuggets of uh, insights here and good questions, I think, that are good to pose. Um, I'm going to go to you, Emma, Emma Stoney who's watching us via YouTube and says, uh, Prof, you know, what about the all carnivore diet? Yeah, well, I pretty much follow that now. I've evolved to eating that. And uh, a lot of people say that it's very good and there've been no complications. I, so I think it's it's very healthy that the carnivore diet. And some people, there are certain things in vegetables that some of us are allergic to, and that's the problem. And so mm. some of the chronic diseases, particularly autoimmune disease, and this is what, if people have autoimmune diseases, this is what I say. First, cut out the vegetables and see what happens and start moving towards a carnivore diet. And, and if it cures you, then you know what the problem was. Of course, that's mm. pretty radical, but I've seen too many patients who've cured themselves of serious illness by, by going on a carnivore diet. Absolutely. And there's, there's a nice component you raised there, Doc, and I'm going to bring up a comment on, on screen again in a moment. Um, the, the, the notion that, you know, when you eat like this, you begin to actually feel better. Let me take it one step further. Even fasting, you know, that long-term fast 
that I spoke of, which was my catalyst into breaking old habits and getting back into ketosis, um, has the autophagy effect um, on the body. And that's exactly the point that Mr. B Belize says. And don't forget that fasting leads to autophagy, the renewal of cells in one's body. Do you want to quickly speak to that? Yes. So autophagy is happens when cells kill themselves, essentially. And they then re regenerate as new cells. And particularly the immune system seems to be really influenced by ketosis and fasting. And you can really vamp up your immune function by that. You know, it's, it's been known for years that eating less and fasting is extremely healthy and has great benefits. Mm. And if I recall, you know, if I go back, we go back to the 1400s and, you know, I'm mainly British, British background. The English ate once a day. That was what you ate. You didn't eat mm. more than once a day. And the, the idea that humans have to eat six times a day is completely nonsensical. Mm. Mm. And, and let's speak to that nonsense because it, it's drummed into people like us in particular who will consult dietitians and medical experts, again, expecting good uh, uh, advice. You know, we'll, we'll be told, no, 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 no. You've got to break down your meals, small portions, um, you know, five to six times a day. And then there's one dietitian, I will name nobody, of course, but there's one dietitian who I then asked the question. I said, look, ma'am, I've done the research. As far as I understand, if my body is swimming in insulin, in other words, the hormone that responds to a meal that I've eaten, it is physically impossible for me to then burn fat in that period. And she sort of had this little moment, Prof, of like, you know, so like a, you know, like a, an appliance glitches, like, like um, and I was like, well, surely you've got to be able to reconcile this. Is it not better for me to limit my eating window to allow the body to heal? Because I was basically asking about that first fast I was about to embark on. And she just said, no, I insist on multiple meals a day. That's surely bad advice, Prop. Well, it's terrible advice. But basically, mm -hmm. dietitians are taught a particular focused way of teaching and they have no other solution. You know, that's not all dietitians. I must say that the people are changing. Yes. And yes. now, now doctors, and I had a debate with some dietitians, says, oh, insulin resistance is a real issue. And we do tell our people to restrict their carbohydrates. Well, 12 years ago or 10 years ago, they weren't saying that at all. They, That's they right. hadn't realized that there is a condition like insulin resistance. And secondly, carbohydrates make it worse. So there has been progress, but there's, there's a lot. There's a lot more progress that has to be made. Absolutely. Prof, I've just put up another question by Chantal. Shout out to you, Chantal. Also watching us on YouTube, chocolate, uh, 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 Prof. You know, I mentioned, for example, that I use that long-term fast to break my habits and, and addictions. But, you know, what are some of the ways to get around this? Because some people generally do have a sweet tooth, so to speak. And even if they are on a banting diet, what can they do? Yeah, it's a sugar addiction. You have to acknowledge that it's an addiction and that... And if you have an addiction to alcohol, it doesn't help drinking a little bit a day. You have to cut completely. And the same with sugar. So, Chantal, I'm sorry to tell you, you have to look at, you said the disadvantages. Well, you have to focus on those disadvantages. And if they are real and you're really concerned about them, you must just get, you have to cut all sugar. And, and the chocolate will be part of that. It took me 14 months to get over my sugar addiction. And I, literally, mm. if I look at sugar, I will be back eating the sugar within two days if I if I was to to break that addiction. Fortunately, 10 years down the road, there's no way I'm going to eat sugar again. But mm. it is a massive addiction. And, and we downplay it. The industry downplays it because they know that's the driver of, the, of their profits. Their profits are keeping you sugar addicted. That's that's how they make money. Absolutely. And I just wanted to shout out for uh, Stefan Samuel. Stefanos for the uh, mistake, uh, who says at www.firediabetes.com, we see every day how people are losing weight, reversing diabetes, and of course, autoimmune diseases by following a keto diet and fasting. Um, to the great frustration of endocrinologists and dietitians, there is quite a powerful lobby behind, behind this prof, is there not? Yeah, Dr. Stefanos Neyman is a great friend of mine. He's doing a magnificent job with his fire diabetes program. He is reversing diabetes and doing a magnificent job. So he's someone to speak to. And he's not scared to tell people that they that they are profession that they're doing it wrong. Absolutely. I've just put a, 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 a I'll call it funny, but not really, because I understand this person's 
our, our predicament. Um, you know, uh, uh, sorry, I just lost my own page here. How can I avoid Holland once a week? This is a serious question. I mean, six days on, one day off. Holland, of course, being a slow cooked, uh, um, I'll call it a Jewish, a traditional Jewish stew. Uh, it does have lots of meat, um, but also lots of vegetables. It can be quite carby. Surely it's just removing the carb elements, focusing on the meat and creating more of a broth? Absolutely. And, and if you're only eating it once a week and you're seriously following the diet the rest of the week, that's fine. Because it's not sugar. You know, it's we, had, we don't have a problem with, with not processed carbohydrates. They, they fine occasionally. But once you're diabetic, then you have to be a little more cautious. But if you're not mm. diabetic, there's no reason why you have to avoid all carbohydrates. You just have mm. to make sure that you, you don't eat more than you, your body can cope with. Absolutely. And my personal advice, and this is more dietary, not dietary, um, recipe advice than, than dietary, just take the potatoes out, man. <laughs> take the potatoes out and the pro barley and you'll be fine. Trust me, I make cholent once a week also on my Shabbos, but... Um, That'll be my advice to you. Prof, let me just fish for a few more questions here. Um, and perhaps as I do that, talk to me about, you know, uh, there'll be someone who's who's fearful, maybe an actual diabetic, and they're listening to the show after years and years and years of advice, after years and years of years of being told, for example, that this little pill pack over here is your life forever. Um you know, that person is listening to something here. This sounds like, you know, fish oil or, you know, uh, you know, uh, some magic. You know, I, I'm once a diabetic, always diabetic. Well, that's absolutely not true. So we know that we can reverse diabetes in, in the majority of people and we can get them off insulin. So insulin is a treatment you don't want if you're diabetic. You want to be using medications like metformin, but not insulin because insulin is the real killer. See, we, we people with diabetes, we're already producing too much insulin. The insulin doesn't work. That's why we're diabetic. And that's giving right. more insulin doesn't make sense. You've got to get off the insulin. So that's key. So, you know, I didn't draw attention to, this is the most recent book we've written, The Eat Right Revolution. Mm -hmm. and, and I talk there about what's insulin resistance because I've not read a book, a popular book for the general public about what is insulin resistance. So mm. I've put together a chapter here on insulin resistance and, 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 and why you need to understand if you're insulin resistance, carbohydrates, if you're insulin resistance, carbohydrates will kill you. And it doesn't matter what else you do. Those carbohydrates will just wear you out. They kill your arteries. Mm. And I put in mm. the, the first time there's a decent picture. And, and people have to understand that, that this is the diagram of what's happening to your body if you're insulin resistant and you're eating a high carbohydrate diet. Those mm. are all the things that are going wrong. And most importantly, mm. it's the visceral fat. It's the fat you store in your abdomen. That's the real mm. killer. That's what That's kills right. you. You know, it's not That's cholesterol right. or LDL cholesterol or lipoproteins. It's the inflammation mm. that's coming from this, your cells in your adipose tissue in your abdomen. And mm. that's what kills you. And you've got to get rid of it. And the only way to get rid of it is a high fat, high protein, low carbohydrate diet. You can run mm. all you like. And that's mm. why when you go and watch the comrades, and I'm a comrades runner in the past, and you see these people or the, or the cycle tours who are carrying this belly. Yet they can mm. run kilometers, but it's not helping them because, well, it's helping a bit, but it would, they'd do much better if they changed their diet and stopped eating all those carbs. Mm. So if, I, if there's one message I can, can give your audience is get a tape measure and measure your waist, mm. and it must be less than half your height. Mm. That's the ratio. Waist less than half your height. Then you're not likely to have visceral obesity and you're not likely to be at risk of developing diabetes and all these complications. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, visceral obesity is the single biggest predictor of fatalities in COVID-19. And the, exactly. best thing you can do, the best thing you can do if you have a risk of COVID-19 is get your waist thin and eat mm -hmm. a high fat, high protein, low carbohydrate diet and lose that adipose tissue because that's what kills you. It's those cells 
with the COVID infecting those cells, those cells just burst out and give you this mm. massive inflammation that causes you to die. Absolutely. Prof, as we taper off our conversation, uh, thank you very much, by the way, for, for staying with me a little bit extra. Um, you know, the, the, there is a conversation to be had, and I'm just seeing a question pop up on here. Let me just quickly answer it from Brendan Campbell. Uh, Brendan, it's now been three weeks uh, of effect effectively, a the first week was a four, five day fast. Um, in that week, I dropped 6.5 kilograms. Uh, then I transitioned to a 24 um, intermittent uh, daily fast. That's 20 hours fasted, four hours eating window. Um, I haven't weighed myself quite yet very recently, but over last week, I only dropped a single kilogram in the week, uh, which is totally fine. I've always said, you know, I'm not going to hold myself to, you know, instant weight loss uh, goals. I mean, they're great, but, you know, it's getting the, the cycle right first. And of course, now um, I've sort of moved to 16, 8. I'll transition. I'll chop and change, but I'll always fast in the process. And I haven't weighed myself very recently. So I just had to give that quick feedback, Prof, um, so that people understand where I am at the moment. And, and a further FYI, I'll probably do a 76-hour fast uh, sometime in the course of this week, just to sort of get myself back, because I can feel I can feel sometimes, Prof. I must be honest, uh, a few cravings coming back, uh, and um, mm. you know, it, for me, the fasting is a nice way to break that uh, that cycle. Um, so perhaps I just get in there for a second. The best result yes, yes, we've had in South Africa was 81 kilograms lost in 28 weeks. 81 Whoa. kilos. The reason your weight loss has slowed a bit is because a lot of the weight initially was water. And that as soon as you get your insulin down, you start to lose water. But uh, if you can keep up two kilograms a week, that's that's amazing. That's fantastic. Absolutely. And, and, and Absolutely. I just add the one point that if you stall, you must increase the protein in your diet. That's that's mm -hmm. the key. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Prof, as we, maybe, as I said, I really, we should taper off the conversation. I know people are keen to hear more, but I will hopefully have the Prof on again um, and other voices in the future. Uh, prof, as we, as we shut down the conversation, leave, leave us with a bit of hope um, because there's someone watching right now and they might be in a very painful place uh, in their lives right now. You know, I, 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 I don't mean to trivialize food addiction. I went through it myself. I know what it is to eat for emotional reasons. Um, and I know what it is to, to have a snack become a crutch, if I can call it that. That person right now is gaining the weight. They're feeling sick. Um, I'll talk to you briefly about what I went through. You know, I, I knew I was hitting the diabetes route where, for example, I'd wake up every two hours to go pee and, you know, that, that, mm. that, that terrible thirst um, for water. You know, you can feel yourself getting sick, Prof. Talk to me about that person giving them hope. Um, is changing what's on their plate um, the, the, the beginning of the road back to health for South African families in particular? Yeah, I think, you know, my opinion after having looked at this now for 10 years or so, because remember, I was the guy who promoted all the running and I ran 70 marathons and ultra marathons. And so I thought exercise was a solution, but it didn't help me. I became obese and diabetic. And then fortunately, I came across the Atkins diet and the Banting diet and then was able to promote that. So I lost my weight. My running improved dramatically. And I'm at 72. I'm reasonably healthy. You know, I can't say I'm 100 percent, but because who knows what's going to happen tomorrow, but I'm, I'm relatively healthier and much healthier than if I hadn't changed my diet. My, mm. my conclusion is that what you eat is the most important factor determining your health. And mm. you really see it at my age. Once you go beyond 60, what you've been eating before those 60 is a problem. And that, that sets you up for, for future life. And I'm watching the people of my age, 60 to 70, and I'm noticing they're slowing down and their minds are changing and, and they're not as healthy as they might be. And, and all I know is that the sooner you get on this diet and you stop eating the ultra processed food, the quicker you'll start to get healthy. And it includes your mental health. Having mm. a diet that is full of sugar and refined carbohydrates, ultra processed food is very bad for your brain. And it mm. gives you 
emotional down. And so what I can assure you is that it's so easy to adopt to this diet if you can get over the food addictions and the sugar addictions. Mm. If you can get over them, the, the future is unbelievable. And you won't believe how good you feel. That, that's the thing. You can't understand how good you're going to feel compared to mm. what you were feeling. So the, the message of hope is that if you've got the courage to change, I can assure you it's going to make a massive difference to the rest, every single day for the rest of your life. And, Absolutely. you know, what, why I'm so glad, because I have a fatal disease. Diabetes is a fatal disease, and I've had to learn how to live with it. And yeah. fortunately, when I get to the time when I'm going to die, I, I will say, you know, I did my best. I, whatever yeah. else, I did my best. But if you get to, to 65 and you've lost your limbs and you you think, you know, maybe I could have done it differently. And, and that's the terrible thing. And you, you don't want to reach my age and say, I could have done it differently. So that's my mm. message. Please change now. And, and don't believe what you're being told in the mainstream media. Mm. You know, read mm. the stuff I write. And literally, you know, there's no one in South Africa who's read as much about nutrition as I have or written about it as much as I have. And if I if it didn't work, I wouldn't be saying it. And and it stood the mm. test of time. People tried mm. to kick me out of the profession for being wrong, and it turned out I was right. And that's uh, that's, <laughs> that's a very important point. No one else in the world has Absolutely. gone to court to prove that the diet they're promoting is correct. I did it. Mm. Only person mm. in the world is done it. And that and that it was a flawless presentation. They couldn't mm. fault one thing that we said. Yeah. Mm. Over and 12 prof, days, 12 days uh, in court under oath. <laughs> and I can tell you now, Prof, people like me, people like me who actually do suffer from the scourge of obesity, something that is plaguing so many of us, are internally grateful to you because you're actually giving us that fighting chance to not only just cling on to life, but enjoy a better quality of life. Prof, Prof, a super thanks from me. Um, if I may be as bold as to say that I will definitely have you back on the show because there are a few other components that I think we can unpack. Uh, for example, we've run out of time, but I wanted to get into, you know, that criticism that people often say, oh, banting is for the rich. You know, the poor can't do it. Um, in fact, can I please give you just three minutes to dispel that myth? You know, because you will often hear people saying, you know, who can afford to eat in a banting way? The poor can't eat like this, they'll say. Uh, surely there is a, a rebuttal to this. There is. And and specifically to that criticism, my foundation, the Noakes Foundation, developed the Eat Better South Africa campaign. And mm -hmm. before lockdown, we didn't, we didn't impact it on 10 communities. And we'd shown them that you can eat the banting diet healthily for 30 rand a day. Now, I know 30 rand is a lot of money. For a lot of people but it's not mm. three it's not 300 rand a day so mm -hmm. and it's simple you just eat the nutrient dense foods which are the exactly. offal you mentioned that you were raised on exactly offal. This eye. offal is cheap mm. and incredibly healthy liver mm. is the most nutrient dense food on the planet the second is sardines and the third are eggs so we built everything around that and vegetables, mm. lots of vegetables because they're relatively cheap. But canned mm. fish and canned meat is cheap. And you can put together a diet and reverse diabetes on that sort of diet. It's not, it's not eating steak every night, but at least it is mm. eating food that is filling and can reverse your diabetes and reverse obesity. Absolutely. That, of course, is Professor Tim Noakes, who has laid down the nutritional law here on the Big Daddy Liberty Show. Prof, I'm going to put those books uh, in the descriptors of this video. Uh, you know, you'll just share with me again the titles on our WhatsApp chat group. Um, and I'll definitely make sure that people are reading this book. As I said, I'll have the good prof back on the show and many other voices, especially as I embark on this journey of be moving from hashtag obese to beast. Um, so prof, thank you very much. <laughs> to you uh, for that. Uh, any final words, Prof, and how do the people reach you? Uh, I'm through the Noakes Foundation on the website. You know, looking at these comments, the, the, you know, that just shows how clever South Africans are because every single comment is 
is fantastic. You know, that's mm. just show that people understand they're not being fooled. So that's thank you. So thank you. Just you're an amazing host, as everyone knows, and that's why you're so popular. But it thank was you, just sir. amazing. After I'll do this once a week if you ask me, and you know, I'll do it. As often as you ask, I'm here. <laughs> Prof, I may hold you to something close to that. But with that being said, thank you so much. That, of course, is Professor Tim Noakes. And thank you, dear viewer, for watching the show. Man, what a great show. Um, I hope it's something that allowed you to perk up a little bit to say, hey, man, if c can do it, if Big Daddy can do it, then you can do it too, guys. Obesity should not be our death sentence. Diabetes, hypertension, and all the associated metabolic diseases that come with being severely over overweight or even obese should not be our death sentence. We can beat obesity. And with that being said, it's figures like Professor uh, Tim Noakes who are really leading the charge in that regard. And he's quite right in saying that he has tried and tested in a literal sense. So he'll definitely be the sort of voice that I listen to when it comes to me reclaiming my life and my quality of health. With that being said, thank you for watching. This has been another production of the Big Daddy Liberty Show. I will see you on Sunday for Liberty and Friends. Remember, Liberty and Friends, we wrap up the news week that was with a panel of key thinkers. I'll see you on Sunday. And uh, a reminder to you, a reminder to you, and I might adapt it for this episode. <laughs> um, Y'all know I usually say never trust the commie. Uh, <laughs> but in this instance, I'll say never trust a hashtag fat acceptance lefty. Let's beat the obesity and let's do it for our faith flag family and freedom. Good night, South Africans, and remember, be ever wonderful.